series of videos, articles, and blogs over the past couple of years, I've been concerned about the troubling turn in psychoanalysis that has increasingly embraced identity politics under the guise of social justice and anti-racism advocacy. Two studies on race and psychoanalysis were commissioned by the two largest psychoanalytic organizations in the United States. The American Psychoanalytic Association, or APSA, and the Division 39 of the American Psychological Association. The Society for Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology, which is Division 39, contracted an internal study of members' experiences who identify as people of color at the tune of $30,000, while APSA initiated a much more comprehensive and ambitious project that surveyed the institution of American psychoanalysis in general, which cost the membership a whopping 210,000 to date, if not much more, a financial detail it is not being transparent about publicly. The results of both studies conclude that Division 39 APSA and the entire field of psychoanalysis in America is systemically racist. I wish to dispute these findings based on palpable research bias in scope, design, and implementation, ideological contamination in the collection of data, and false attributions to the field as a whole based on the unscrupulous assumptions of critical social justice theory. Put laconically, for reasons I will argue, the Division 39 study is partisan, ungeneralizable, and lacks scientific merit, while the APSA Commission is based on fallacious premises and is severely methodologically flawed. Neither the results nor conclusions can be widespread in the field, especially in such a simplified manner, and whatever phenomenological data that remains valid based on personal experience or knowledge is not reflective of the whole discipline. It may be argued that the two largest American psychoanalytic organizations just blew a quarter of a million dollars as a diversity, equity, and inclusion ruse designed to placate political correctness and earn brownie points by waxing race optics when they are no more than an exercise in grievance by a select few disgruntled people who simply want to complain, problematize, and disrupt the field. Spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you a synopsis of my critique. What is notably salient in, in both reports is that they are drenched in woke ideology. Every aspect from design to content is blinkered by critical race theory, or CRT, propaganda baked into the very fabric of the studies. We must accept as a starting premise, which is treated as empirical fact, that systemic racism and white privilege saturate American psychoanalysis at its very core that the tenets of CRT and critical social justice, or CSJ, are correct and indisputable, and that white supremacy is attributed to all whites, regardless of class, and who are clumsily lumped into the same sociopolitical category as white supremacist fringe groups and white nationalists. Of course, it goes without saying uh, that if you question the conclusion that is treated as an unquestioned proposition, such as, please show me you know, uh, evidence that all we, our white people are white supremacists, then you are simply smeared as a white supremacist as proof for asking the question in the first place. Circular reasoning, begging the question, non sequiturs, and straw men are everywhere. In short, informal fallacies of logic saturate the content, construction, and design of the studies that in turn prejudice the results and conclusions based in indefensible emotional 
hyperbole. Moreover, these studies lack scientific credibility and employ methodolo methodologies that do not demonstrate objective criteria nor follow replicable procedural standards, hence failing in reliability, validity, unverifiability, and falsifiability criteria, for they do not allow for the computation of conjectures. The survey and interview methods involved appear entirely subjective in scope and design and are based in personal disclosures and self-reports rather than having a normative standard to test, affirm, or reject hypotheses. In SWIFT, these survey results are based on personal attitudes, subjective opinions, or esoteric lived experience as doxa under the guise of objectivity that cannot be meaningfully generalized or attributed to larger populations. There are no random control samples, groups, or trials. Experimental methods employed or quantitative data to confirm or compare with and are based entirely on personal narrative we are expected to accept as unadulterated truth without question or subjected to further logical, rational, or scientific scrutiny. The, re revolts of the results of the two studies suffer from confirmation bias, self-selection sampling, or cherry picking, observation selection effects, or what uh, is typically known as anthropic bias, which is so-called evidence that has been sifted through the precondition that there actually is some suitably positioned observer to have objective evidence untainted by subjective prejudice. In other words, any attempts to derive valid conclusions is potentially corrupt from the start. Any result is, is therefore inferential and speculative at best and must be conservatively weighed although probability, propensity, and confirmation theories do just that, all one really has to do is quibble with or, or tweak the premises to get the desired outcome one wants. This all depends upon how you choose to define your, your reference class, classify the sample according to specific properties you want to emphasize, and hypotheses you want to test. But here, there is nothing to test, only bald assertions. A predicate is not proof of itself. There is always an irreducibly subjective element to predication that can change from person to person and condition to condition under different personal motivations and contextual circumstances unless it can be independently verified and objectively corroborated as generalizable fact. In summary, the methodological problems with these studies involve paradoxes of self-sampling assumptions, reference class problems, relativity of observers and observations made, and the abstract use of preconceived propositions as self-evident truths merely taken for granted that are not empirically probable, not to mention the fact that all observations and, and conclusions are hermeneutically mediated interpretations that are irreducibly subjective, which permeate and contaminate the integrity of these studies. When research data rely solely on subjective feelings, intuition, and perceptions based on selective sampling biases, they are not the same as objective evidence that can be generalized across the, broad, across the board to large swaths of people. We may pretty much discount the survey results as merely anecdotal and not generalizable to social collectives based on methodological flaws alone. My overall assessment is that the results of these two studies express some select people's subjective unhappiness, cynicism, and personal grievances that while sincere based on their private or intimate feelings and experiences peculiar to that person, are then falsely attributed to the whole institution of American psychoanalysis, which is simply unwarranted. Now that I have told you the substance of my critique, let us closely examine some 
specifics of the two studies. First is the Division 39 study. In January uh, 2023, a, a DEI consultant, Dr. Sipu Humbuke, prepared a report for the Division 39 of the APA that was released later that spring to the membership. The title of the study is called The Truth of Being Different, The Experiences of BIPOC in Division 39. In describing the context and background of the commission study, after comparing the organization to the quote silence and quote consent of George Floyd's murder, we are immediately told that quote the problem is quote issues of racial inequality based on violence toward BIPOC members, end quote. We further are f informed that the society, quote, has been blind to racial injuries uh, by some members, and, and this, quote, situation mirrors, replicates, and is implicated in a much wider situation of systemic injustice in our society at large, end quote. The rhetoric of violence dramatizes the parameters of the study and precludes any objective appraisal from the start. Surely no one has been physically assaulted by members of the organization. But here, silence is violence, and BIPOC members have purportedly been harmed by white members and the society. It turns out that uh, such so-called injuries are simply attributed to a small fraction of people with an N of 11 out of over 3,000 members who have had their feelings hurt, felt excluded, or have complained about feeling marginalized, experiences that can be said of anybody. In fact, we're, we're told that these 11 participants were not randomly sampled, but rather cherry-picked self-selection sampling bias from the president of the society at the time, Dr. Joseph Schaller who wanted vocal, upset members to, quote, speak their truth, end quote. We are further informed that these, quote, sources of truth included interviews with five members and six graduate students and early career psychologists, all lumped together, over four Zoom sessions lasting two hours each, but not everybody attended all the meetings nor stayed for the whole group interview. The mean age of participants was 22 years old, barely out of undergraduate university, if that. Given we can no more place stock in generalizing these results to an entire organization based on the statistically small sample size alone, especially given they were hand-selected and, and pre-designated as aggrieved subjects, the results of the study can only be viewed from the standpoint of limited case narratives at best. That hardly meets an objective criterion of truth. Not only is the study methodologically compromised and ungeneralizable to the entire membership, it is riddled with CRT, CSJ propaganda, and DEI ideology premised on, on the notion that all white people in society are white supremacists, privileged, and racist. But who is racist against whom? From the anecdotal interview data offered in personal quotes, it becomes perfectly transparent that the aggrieved have a personal ax to grind based in deep-seated hostilities that are quite frankly an unapologetic spate of anti-white racism. Here are just some of the quotes. The organization is, quote, the last stronghold of absolute white supremacy. Another quote, is an incestuous white lineage. It's lily white. They get the whitest person, so it's so galling, and they have the nerve to charge black people to attend a conference. If we were to substitute the terms white for black, 
that it would immediately ignite outrage for devaluing black people uh, using such race-baiting tropes. The author of the study, Dr. Mbuke, an assistant professor of diversity and inclusion, is unable to disguise his ideological worldview when he concludes, without any proof, that the whole Division 39 has perpetrated, quote, aggression and violence, end quote, toward its BIPOC members, itself a basket category that, that does not even remotely entertain the actuality of differences that inform the overdetermined nature of identity. And as a, quote, age, age, agent of violence, end quote, the division must, quote, face the victim and, quote, give back the humanity you took, end quote. We are then further lectured in DEI gaslighting techniques by way of a crass reduction to the systemic racism that mirrors society at large, as if all psychoanalysts are racist by default and are a fortiori accused of being a perpetrator, only to be reproached from the self-anointed morality police. Um, Mbuke uh, inculpates, quote, note, psychoanalysts are not above the fray, they are the fray, end quote. I read this as none other than an assault on the very value and fabric of psychoanalysis twisted through the prism of projected resentment and hostility in search of a whipping boy. Even more unsavory is Umbuke's disdain for the field. In his words, we are reduced to, quote, evil. This statement is simply egregious and belies any credibility that one could possibly salvage from the study. Given the methodologist's brazen contempt for the field, we may ask, who is dehumanizing who? Furthermore, why would the division hire someone who is so biased and scornful to begin with, except for to buy a prejudiced viewpoint due to partisan racial politics? How can the discipline of psychoanalysis be demonized in such a curt and unsophisticated fashion and taken seriously. Rather than view psychoanalysis as a subject worthy of intellectual and empirical validity due to its universal theories and understanding human nature, it is now turned into another bastion of colonial white supremacy one must reject, fight, and trounce. Here pitting members against each other based on a binary of, of skin color is itself an injustice. In fact, we are left with a profound splitting between group reifications of race and difference based on a simple economy that only perpetuates, if not entrenches, division through a victimization mentality fueled by the fantasized interpellation of white oppression. It is simply bogus and unfounded. It should be further noted that Umbuke's final a report is poorly written, contains incomplete sentences, numerous typos, and relies on bullet points rather than a careful and detailed description of the methodology, results, discussion, conclusions, and recommendations that naturally follow from a neutral investigation. Instead, it is largely inarticulate, based on false premises, non sequiturs, straw men, red herring arguments, and ad hominem attacks on whiteness and the field of psychoanalysis to the degree that this rhetoric renders the study incompetent and invalid. And this woke tirade costs $30,000 US. What a complete waste of membership dues. I want my money back. The Holmes Commission on Racial Equality in American Psychoanalysis is my next section. Controversy over the establishment of the Holmes Commission on Racial Equality existed from the very start because it presupposed the very thing it needed to set out to prove. Rather than asking 
Does racism exist within American Psychoanalytic Association? It had already concluded that racism exists on an institutionally wide scale that was perfunctorily generalized to all psychoanalytic institutions in North America. This is clear from the initial statement from the Holmes Commission in 2020, where it specifically states that the commission was, quote, established with the mission of investigating systemic racism and its underlying determinants embedded within APSA, end quote. Now, in the executive summary before the final report was released, this bias is fragrant, fragrantly disclosed. Quote, it was not a, a research study to prove or disprove systemic racism, end quote, simply because it was already presumed and predetermined to be the case. The chair of the commission, Dr. Dorothy Holmes, further repeats that institutional racism exists within our organization before any formal data was collected and properly analyzed by the commission. Although there are important reasons to study the scope of diversity and racial attitudes within our discipline, we should not presume the outcomes uh, of an investigation before they're conducted. By 2023, it was determined by the leadership team that, quote, widespread systemic racism exists within psychoanalytic institutions and within and across various governing bodies for those institutions, end quote, throughout American psychoanalysis itself. I suppose if we presuppose the existence of something, we will find it, manufactured or not. But this is not an objective scientific study. The bias of the Holmes Commission had already been criticized for its partiality before the final report was released on Juneteenth, which received immediate criticism for its prejudice and lack of scientific neutrality an independent commission would be expected to avoid. Instead, the report is laced with uh, CSJ, CRT dogma and calls for a, f a fleet of DEI consultants to exercise racism out of every psychoanalytic crevice in North America. Prior to the release of the final report, the Holmes Commission made its biggest faux pas of all. Dorothy Holmes accused the entire APSA organization of being racist after disinviting a controversial anti-Semite, Dr. Laura Shiai, who made international news, to speak at its summer conference, which resulted in a fracturing of the executive committee, board of directors, and the membership. This scandal led to outrage by progressive minority members cavalierly touting APSA, a white supremacist organization, which pressured the president to resign uh, due to resulting friction and anti-Semitism, condoned by a disgruntled few in leadership egged on by identity politics. Dr. Beverly Stout, co-chair of the Holmes Commission, also resigned from the executive committee. The organizational scandal led to an embarrassing expose in The Guardian, where the field of American psychoanalysis was portrayed as being, quote, psychotic. Because the final report of the Holmes Commission is the size of a book, I shall confine my, my critique here to a few sections and various summaries due to time constraints. In a bulletin of preliminary findings, the commission states that it, quote, enlisted an expert meth methodologist to develop a research design to conduct an empirically based analysis of how racism manifested in psychoanalytic institutes. This statement shows how delib they deliberately wanted to study, designed to find what one wants the conclusions to be. Its political motives are also transparent as it dictates, quote, prescriptions for organizational structures, end quote, as a policy initiative to change the entire field 
from curriculum content, training, and supervision that focuses on anti-racism and social justice. In the executive summary, we're told that initially 7,400 potential participants were invited to participate in the study, 2,259 responded, 1,990 fell within three identified groups the study wanted to address, namely one, faculty, staff, and administrators, two, candidates in institutes, and three, potential uh, training candidates, people that are not in training yet. While 269 volunteers wanted to, quote, offer information on race, end quote. So, most invitees did not want to participate in the survey knowing what the topic and agenda was about, while those who did were likely aligned with its progressive activist cause. It is also not surprising that BIPOC voices were given a, a priority, once again lumping diverse groups in, of people into a generic category for data collection purposes, rather than identifying differences within group differences which would give us a, a better breakdown of demographics and their varied response sets. In examining the pool of participants, we can see that groups are based on self-selection sampling techniques subject to confirmation bias rather than a random sampling of participants. So naturally the results are based on loaded dice due to the political motivation of volunteers who had already accepted the predetermined outcome that psychoanalysis was steeped in systemic white racism. The ideology of CRT saturates all dimensions of the study, including the fact that every group is racialized and definitions are simply taken for granted. For example, uh, we are told that, quote, systemic racism as a system produces advantage for some people in a dominant racial group through the oppression of people in a non-dominant racial group, end quote. By its very definition, anyone who is not considered part of the majority racial group, namely whites and Jews, are cast as being dominated and oppressed by virtue of being a member of a minority faction. This asserts the very proposition it has the task to prove. Moreover, it has no basis in fact, as many uneducated, unemployed, and working class whites would fall into class-based poverty and are, no, are in no way privileged, let alone dominating or oppressing anyone. And given that South Asians and, and Asians have the highest income per capita in the U.S., over their white counterparts and other immigrant populations, they could hardly claim to be subjugated. Within the report, this self-serving contrived definition of systemic racism by the commission makes it impossible to refute as any minority group is automatically ident identified as a victim of white oppression by fiat. The copious use of CRT bud buzzwords such as white supremacy, white fragility, racial trauma, oppression, colonization, intersectionality, marginalization, and microaggressions, just to name a few, are used liberally throughout the study to justify the results that are already presupp presupposed. For example, a microaggression is anything a person deems to be offensive. Oh, only to claim its motivation is based in racial hatred, when it may simply be based on psychic projection, distortion, or one's own emotional prejudices attributed to others. It also assumes that any disagreement, uh, legitimate criticism, or debate about any matter could s simply be chalked up to racism based on subjective whim. Here, no evidence is required all one needs to do is accuse and point a finger as a demonstration of proof when it's merely performative fluff. This bombast is furthermore ingenuine, hostile, uncivil, and slanderous. Furthermore, when examining the content 
of the survey questions and themes. They are weighed in terms of feelings rather than facts. Personal perceptions, feelings, beliefs, self-knowledge, and intuitions are not the same as objective evidence falsely attributed to whole populations that are artificially defined into myopic, binary, racial classifications based on skin color and identity. Moreover, no specific examples are given that allow us to judge for ourselves if, if racism even occurred. We simply must take their word for it. Although I have no doubt that you know, racist enactments and personal experiences occur, as this is part of human nature, we cannot remotely assume to generalize to a universal from a particular without justifiable evidence. What we may conclude, however, is that this research design was constructed as an exercise inventing personal and microgroup grievances. The Holmes Commission is so conceptually, methodologically, and politically biased that it demands racial, quote, equity rather than equality in its policies and procedures. Despite our shared egalitarian and democratic principles, one should never assume equality of outcome. Like everything in life, privilege is earned, not automatic, and is based on merit not entitlement. Now my, my conclusions. It is puzzling why the 50 board members of APSA would see the value and rationale for conducting such a parochial study, let alone justify such an exorbitant expense based on ideological premises that are taken for granted rather than scientifically examined in an impartial and neutral manner. The Holmes Commission could have skipped to the chase and offered their recommendations based on personal observations, experiences, and attitudes, some of which are quite reasonable, rather than dwindle the organization's reserve funds based on DEI optics. What is most certain is that the board concealed from its membership the magnitude of money squandered on such a futile endeavor that already had a prearranged outcome before any study was conducted at all. Due to such ostensive bias, the findings should be dismissed and the Homes Commission defunded, if not dismantled entirely. Any further support of such inane attempts to diabolize the whole discipline of psychoanalysis as a racist stronghold of white supremacy is to pander to delusion. The coup should be permanently quelled. When viewed as a political strategy designed to accuse, berate, and cull power, both research initiatives by Division 39 and APSA reveal a sham under the guise of identity politics. At a lo lofty price tag of what it would cost to buy a Bentley, even a house in some communities, there is little scientific rigor to justify the expense to the members, uh, let alone the conclusions offered as hasty generalizations based on false propositions and fallacies of attribution. Both studies are distorted in their fundamental assumptions governing social reality based in CSJ, CRT ideology, do not provide demonstrable truth or evidence or show concrete, verifiable examples that can be objectively validated, are based on activist cant and do not follow conventional approaches to research methods construction and design, data collection, statistical analysis, nor do they address limitations, including a critique or a critical discussion. In pithy form, these studies are unconvincing at best and have no generalizability past the subjective experiences of those who have encountered racism. What raises the hermeneutics of suspicion are the emotive 
prejudices and political agendas of those who were intimately involved in carrying out these studies with the presupposition that ra systemic racism exists within the institution of psychoanalysis itself before any investigations were conducted at all. Members of both organizations should compel the executive or elect new leadership that will no longer coddle cry bullies hell-bent on demolishing the field. Given what we know of politics, operative and group identifications, and collective organizational life, it is noteworthy to point out that most of the individuals involved in the investigative teams were comprised of people of color or minority identi identities with some token whites giving an appearance of inclusion. This is particularly relevant with regards to the APSA Homes Commission, where we are informed how different racial demographics generated tensions, divisions, conflicts, and racist enactments within the working groups, which were disclosed as part of the research findings. We should not be surprised that when people are reduced to the color of their skin, racial characteristics, ethnicity, or gendered identities, an unnecessary focus on difference will introduce discomfort and spur antagonism that only serves to erode more collective identifications, goals, and ideals all parties share in common. It is also ironic, or ironic excuse me, that psychoanalysts would engage in the most developmentally primitive splitting mechanisms they are so adept at analyzing. But we are all too human. We cannot continue to allow the toxicity of racial politics and discourse to contaminate the field. Elders in the community need to speak up and protest. An opposition needs to speak out forcefully. We should not be silent or be complicit. As the helping professions in general and mental health therapies in particular reside under threat of being ideologically captured by officious social activism, there's too much at stake to remain passively unworried. This crisis will not simply blow over or go away. The field is suffering from a failure of nerve to, con to confront an injustice it is allowing to happen. It's time to buck up and show some courage. We should not be afraid of the sophist ploys of being called a racist simply uh, for being white or for having uh, a compete, competing argument or dissenting opinion that differs from illiberal mentality. We should demand the civility and democratic right to debate different points of view as an exercise in professional and academic freedom without being attacked by an authoritarian woke mob. The most obvious ob observation raises a simple question that is never asked. Why would people of color and so-called oppressed identities want to belong to a white supremacist institution when it purportedly is so noxious and antithetical to their values? Since they despise the colonization of psychoanalysis so much, why would they uh, want to belong to a club they don't even like, especially when all they have is animus, envy, entitlement, and resentment for white people and Jews? If the very establishment is so flawed and racist, why would they not start their own psychoanalytic institutes? where they feel they belong in a, and are free to pillory whitey with the self-congratulatory applause with immunity at their heart's content. If the collectivist values and universal theories psychoanalysis has to offer society and the intelligentsia has no appeal, it would be better to start from ground zero 
and build a new institution where one feels a sense of camaraderie and mutual purpose. But this does not entail the right or legitimacy to tear down the foundations of psychoanalysis and its legacy that conditions the history of psychology based on animosity, transference, and counter-transference to Western civilization and expect others to simply roll over submissively and take a bare paddling based on coercion or connivance. Thank you for listening.